This dude had this amount of hey! to give. What's up everybody, Jack here with another video. There is a channel that we have not watched in quite a bit. He is highly knowledgeable and one who wears the face of High the Pain Herald. I'm of course talking about everyone's favorite internet historian. And on today's episode of how fucked up is fucked up, we have the cost of Concordia. My god, <laughs> what a year. That happened in 2012. And 2012 was such a wonderful year, right? Uh, I remember already back then people were making speculation about the end of the world and people were like, no, 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 you know, those Mayans, they, they were dyslexic with the road to calendar. They actually meant 2021. <laughs> and I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But no, seriously, it was a terrible year. Aside for doomsday scenario, we had what? Hurricane Sandy. We had uh, freaking North Korea launching a missile that threatened the entire world all of a sudden. We had, uh, well, Syria that was in bloody flames. One more. Yeah, Xi Jinping came in power back then. We need a freaking poo. And uh, we had Kony 2012. Coney, yeah, you remember that guy? <laughs> the dictator that they never found. Yeah, fucking Coney was also part of it. Like 2012 was filled to the brim with disasters. But we've got The Dark Knight Rises, The Avengers and Dread 3 fucking D for my 40k fans out there. So it was actually good. But now we have the cost of Concordia, something that I actually wanted to go to uh, at some point when the, the, the cruiser crashed because uh, I heard that, uh, that, that there was a lot of fun going down there, but we wasn't allowed to travel. So yeah, that was good. Anyways, let's jump into the video. <sighs> the Costa Concordia, <laughs> ship of dreams. It's been eight years. I can still smell the buffets from their five restaurants. <laughs> the casino and three-story theater had hardly been used. Okay, I I'm going to make a, a, a claim here right now. There is and never will be a use for such extravagant things on a ship. I don't care if you want to have the experience of a sailing city. This is not Warhammer 40k. We don't need a battle barge floating in the ocean. Okay? We don't need that. Stay on a city. Gosh! Why? See, see, this is why we have the Old Testament. Bruh. Okay? <laughs> to, to prevent us from doing these things. Anyways. A uh, bad joke. <laughs> let's, let's jump into this. Ah, uh, the gym, the day spa, the sheets in her uh, 1500 luxurious cabins hadn't even been slept in. Costa Concordia cost $570 million to build. And you could tell. You could really tell. Oh my god. A wonderful piece of engineering that I give them, but the event. I remember it like it was just a few years ago. We had left Civitavecchia, a port in Rome, and we were making our way to Savona. It didn't even go it that was far. day two of our seven day journey. But that ship, I, she was cursed. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. When she the traditional bottle of champagne. <laughs> I didn't shut up. Aside, Instead of smashing. How bad uh, but I'm not the superstitious type. Nothing could go wrong on Friday the 13th of January 2012. On the 100th year anniversary of the... Holy shit. Okay, this one... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not supposed to trust in superstitions, but... When you witness something like this... What do you say to yourself? Well... She's pure evil! Uh, the ship! <laughs> She's gone to crash! She'll sink to the ocean! Cue in the clip of uh, the Titanic. But the ship can't sink. The Titanic? On a ship that's also only safety rated for two compartment flooding? Especially not when you have a five star max level captain like Francisco Scatino. 
a man who mysteriously rose from head of security to the position of captain within just a couple of years. He knows exactly what to do in case of an emergency. For example, when he caused this emergency in 2008, when he crashed into a port in Sicily. And in 2010, in Vernemont, Germany, when he was steering a different ship and came into port too fast and caused another... How did they let this guy still work? Okay, I heard this thing that after the crash of the of Concordia, like he, well, of course he's left his ship, right? Perfect captain, let the ship sink, and he went home. This dude had this amount of fucks to give. With either the crew, the company, or whatever. He had zero fragizels to give about this entire thing. And this just shows. This is what? Two years apart each. I've got a good feeling. <laughs> so let's set the scene. It's a beautiful evening. People are having fun on the slides. Drinks at the bar. Antonio Magnotta is playing piano at the restaurant. Martin the Magician is setting up for his show. And the ship is setting up for a little detour. It's called a sail by salute. Basically, you get yeah. real close to the shore and honk the horn. The locals hate it, but the customers love it, and it's a tradition. Scatino, the captain, comes into the dining hall with a They will realize that time along the time along the coastline. Remember this face, because you'll be seeing a lot of it later. Scatino eats his dinner with her and socializes for a little while. Oh. Then he, Dominica, and the maitre d' finish up and excuse themselves. They're heading to the bridge. Oh. It's time for that sail by salute. This time, they're going to get closer than ever. Just 1,500 feet from the island of Giglio. Mm -mm. And how are they going to determine this distance? Well, of course, the captain is going to eyeball it. Apparently, it's not an uncommon thing to do. Scatino turns to the fella steering, his helmsman, <laughs> Jacob Rusley Ben. Boy, I love this man's editing. It's beautiful. First interesting tidbit. Costa Crochier has hired Jacob from Indonesia at a rock bottom price. And he's a bit of a newbie to the job. In fact, his profession hitherto, a painter and a cleaner. It's his first time steering a massive ship. No. And he's very excited. I uh, I do not wish to to pull anything here, but was there a language barrier? I'm just saying, because you know when you are, for example, an immigrant, you may have a high degree in something, and unfortunately, your degree sometimes do not apply in the country that you now are. Like I know civil engineers who have come, for example, here to Denmark, who unfortunately had to resort to very, very low-paying jobs. But they had the faculties. They had the means, not the means. <laughs> they had the skills required to, to do the jobs and the knowledge that follows with it. However, the language can be a problem. You have to convert the units. You have to understand what is being said to you to do the job correctly. You can't just eyeball everything. Especially not in the dark. At least, we think he is. It's hard to tell because he doesn't speak English or Italian very well at all. Fucking hell! Who, who thought that this was a good idea? This, this all smells of disaster from the very beginning. Oh my but god. So, the second in command orders the helmsman to 290. Now, don't be confused by these numbers, they're just the degrees on a compass. At the same time, the captain whips out his cell phone and calls former captain Mario Palombo, who lives on the island. Palombo. They chat about the safe distance to Giglio's shores. Name of a detective. It's all very casual. Anyway, Mario says that the safe distance is between 0.3 and 0.4 miles from shore. The captain yeah. is going all in. This is not his first sail by salute, so he's confident in what he's doing. We're going closer than we've ever been before. Boom. The captain's eyeballing it again. Hmm. New heading of 300, he tells the helmsman. Downstairs, Martin is about to cut his assistant in half. And of course, that means that there's already a lady inside this box. She's waiting for the cue, and then she'll poke her legs out. The captain is giving more orders. Pulling gently to 310. Increase speed to 16 knots. Going this fast is going to be a fatal error. But before we talk about that, let's talk about another big problem. Language barrier. 
Mm -hmm. At this point, the captain says 325, but the helmsman relays 315. So the first officer intervenes and he goes, no, 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 335, which is also wrong. And then the captain Not goes, no, 325. The helmsman confirms 325. Their poor communication has them moving at a much wider angle than they think they are. However, the captain should and would know this, except for the next problem. Complacency about procedure. The standard procedure of a ship this large is for the third officer to give exact positional coordinates every time the captain gives a new directional order. But they're not doing that. Oh no. 3.30, he says. The helmsman relays 3.30. The ship reaches 16 knots. The captain then turns to the second officer and instructs him to go to the left wing. I'm sorry. 16 knots is the equivalent of a bike going 30 kilometers per hour. I know that because I would sometimes race with friends who were sailing from one end. I live closer to the beach side. Uh, who were sailing on the sea and I would be biking towards the city. And we'll be doing that and like uh, an average just good pace is like 30 kilometers per hour that's these things here and they basically exist so you can get a bit of but with a ship like that turning it around a few seconds pass it's not a bike maneuver then, the mood starts to turn scatino notices white foam of waves breaking yeah, against the rocks directly in front of him in the distance the Costa Concordia, right now, is almost 700 meters closer to the rocks than it should be. Without deviation, there is going to be a direct collision. Oh, shit! Scatino immediately commands the ship to start turning away. 335! Not enough. The captain shouts, 340! The captain yells, 350! Now, remember how I said that accelerating to 16 knots was a fatal error? Mm -hmm. Well, that's because it's made this ship incapable of such a drastic turn. Because you have to decelerate as well. It's understood. Here's an example. The front end is not working. You're turning exactly. And you're just going straight. You want to go over here, but you're going to end up over here. So despite the order of 350, right now the bow it's is still going, going to go in that direction. Two, seven. Not nearly enough to miss the ah. And oh no, it's about to get worse. That language barrier again. In these critical moments where every second counts, the helmsman wrongly relays 340. The captain snaps back, 350 starboard, or we end up on the rocks. The third officer goes to assist the helmsman. Now, don't get confused by the orders from here. We're changing over to rudder instructions. The captain yells, starboard 10, starboard 20, and still it's not enough. Hard to starboard. That means as hard as it'll go. But at this point, even if they clear these rocks, they need to get the rest of the ship to swing around it. So they the can't. captain yells, midship, which centers the rudder. The bow is now less than 150 meters from Skull Rock. Port 10. Uh... The helmsman only gets to port 5 before another order is given two seconds later. Port 20. They might just avoid disaster here, maybe. But then, oh no. One more time, the helmsman cocks up at the worst possible moment. The helmsman goes to start. Ah, no! Swing. Eight seconds later, he realizes the error and corrects, but it's too oh. He has just turned a probable near miss into a sure hit. All they can do now is hold on as the bow of the ship narrowly passes by the rocks. Hard to port. The second officer yells, we're gonna hit. And we hit. Everybody inside is KO'd. Oh my love. <laughs> Who stole <torture> my spaghetti? <laughs> Ammo. Downtown. Oh my god! <laughs> I forgot! I forgot about Steve his ads! Six, playing Russian roulette. Seems I. Mr. NordVPN. Want a drink all by yourself? Somebody has to. I use I Express, but. I'm many things. 
I'm looking for this fella. I got to find him. It's breaking my little heart. I'll see what I can do. I have contacts in thousands of servers in dozens of countries across the globe. By and the just way, like that, get yourself some to she drink. was gone. The only thing she left was a calling card. Sometimes when you follow a case, it follows you back. Of course it does. NordVPN can protect my online data. But who can protect me? From myself. Oh no. When they said this job gets easier, it was just another Never lie. Does. Forensics found his password spread all the way down the block. In a perfect world, we'd all use NordVPN. But I guess this isn't that kind of story. I took the brakes off my car. Man like me never really learned how to stop. <laughs> the fuck up. I took the steering wheel out too. I let the road take me where I'm supposed to be. That's right, Toots. Your husband's dead. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Oh my god. <laughs> Go to nordvpn.com slash internet historian for a huge discount on a two-year plan. <laughs> Wonderful. Add? Uh, Absolutely. The ship hits rocks on the port side. A 53-meter gash opens up in the hull. Uh! Thousands of tons of water begin pouring in. A loud scraping and bang is heard by all passengers. At the helm, there's panic. Rumblings in the dining room. Martin awkwardly pauses his act as he's helping his assistant into the box. Meanwhile, the lady inside is trapped and terrified. There's confusion oh my across God. the ship. All of the crew off shift come back on duty. All officers run to the bridge. Technical crews run down to the lower decks to assess damage. On connection with the rocks, they lose propulsion and slow to 8.3 knots. And they are now adrift. Close the watertight doors at stern. Enormous volumes of water are pouring in. So much so that within 29 seconds of collision, all six engines stop working through flooding. Morgan Robertson writes the wreck of the Titan, right? And the Titanic is like, you know, we, we, we could make that a reality. And now, Costa Concordia is like, what? You crashed into some iceberg? Bruh, hold my paella. <laughs> what the fuck, man? <laughs> this is insane. 22 seconds later, a blackout happens. Lights, electrics, the water pumps too. Everything. The captain orders the helmsman hard starboard. This is the final position of the rudder before power to that too is lost. The Costa Concordia, now without power, is drifting starboard. Just plunged into absolute darkness. And think about that. A floating a city in flooding. the dark. When the Concordia struck land, it tore open three watertight compartments. At first, compartment five, which filled very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Then six more slowly, four shortly after. Then seven, eight, and three. Modern ships are built to withstand two compartment breaches. These compartments especially, though, are a problem because they contain the engines and the electrics. Uh, yeah. These main generators give power to the whole ship. From propulsion motors to rudder to hotel functions, pretty much everything. When they went out, the ship was a functionless, sinking cage. A few seconds later, the emergency batteries for internal lighting and communications kick on. When the lights come back on, like, get to hell is vanished. Hey! It's the stage. And it caused a huge panic <laughs> as passengers are trying to flee to their cabins and to muster stations. People already in their cabins come out and start putting on life vests. Staff rally and try to calm everyone down. Everything is fine. There's no need for vests. Please return to your cabins. <laughs> the emergency generator starts. <laughs> All of the watertight doors close except for door 12, which is jammed. The captain calls Pilon, the chief engineer, as the ship begins to list on the port side. Mm. There's water coming in? Yes, there's water. But where? The engine room. But a lot of water? Yes. <laughs> what do you think, you dumbass? Let's go down. Let's go down the other <laughs> side. In a moment, we'll start the pumps. I'll let you know. In the theater, the whole magic box apparatus slides right off the stage and falls into the crowd, uh. further increasing panic. On the bridge, an announcement is being prepared. They are going to lie to prevent a panic. Of this course! Is we have a blackout. 
The deputy chief engineer enters the engine control room. He confirms to the bridge that at least compartments five, six, and seven are flooded. Announcements are made. <laughs> the captain to inform you that due to an electrical fault which is currently under control, we are currently in a blackout. Our technicians are working to resolve the situation and will inform you of developments as they occur. Thank you for your attention. Uh, that did not help at the same thing. time in the restaurant. They're playing My Heart Will Go On, and it's very much not helping the situation. Mm -hmm. The captain calls the Costa Crisis Unit. Roberto Ferrarini. He tells the crisis unit that they've hit a rock, that they're assessing damages, and that they are also in a blackout. The crisis office says to reverse the ship up onto shore. Well, how are you going to do that? You don't have power to the rudder, let alone the engine. Yeah. You hoist the sails? Anyway, around this time, the wind direction creates a starboard list, and the ship begins to turn oh, anyway, drifting no. right back towards the shore. Which is a very good thing, because you want the ship to end up as close no, no, to no, shore no, as possible. But a panicked passenger senses that something is off. This isn't like any electrical problem that she's ever seen. Plus, there was a massive crashing noise and now the ship is tilting. So, she contacts her daughter in Italy. The daughter then calls the police, and the police call the harbour master. While that goes on, a conversation between Pilon and Ambrosio. The diesel is not starting. The captain asks the engine room, but where have we made contact? Thinking that the incoming water can be reduced. Captain, here everything is lost. The electrical panel, everything. Oh no! They're saying we at this point them. that the ship is going down. The captain calls Roberto Ferrarini again. Uh, actually, two sweating profusely. Are flooded, but don't worry, the ship's stability isn't in danger. Wrong. Passengers begin going to muster stations on their own initiative. The cruise director says, We have a lot of people at muster stations that I do not want to fall overboard. Do we make an announcement to tell them to go to the lounges? Yes! Bozio says, I think that's best. The harbour master from Livorno calls the ship. The captain tells them that we, we just have a blackout. How long has this blackout been going on? About 20 minutes. Have you asked passengers to put on life vests? It, it's just a blackout. I've got to go. The harbour master is suspicious. He says to his superiors that he thinks something more is going on. What's he calls a the patrol boat to the area and asks them to look at the ship. Another problem. The fan on the emergency diesel generator isn't working properly. Pilon manually has to turn the thing on and off with a screwdriver so that it doesn't overheat and cause a fire. The captain is on the phone to the lower decks asking pointless questions oh, like, poor is it still flooded? Yes. Yes it is. The captain is essentially in denial of the situation. The harbour master calls again. Finally, he says, the ship is taking on water through an opening in the left side and the ship is listing. He qualifies with, no one dead or injured. The harbour master asks if he needs help. Did I need Just a tugboat? <laughs> when in reality, they need a full rescue. Yeah, with just a two. Oh, the my. captain finally realises that things are really bad and they are not going to improve. The Coast Guard orders every available ship to the sea. Meanwhile, up with the passengers, the cruise director's assistant says, uh, everything's under control. Please return to your cabins or hang about in the lounges, no problem. She said this despite knowing it was wrong and that it further endangered lives. Most passengers at this point, though, aren't listening to this nonsense and they're busy figuring out how to abandon ship. Yeah. Bang, 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 bang. And of course, it reaches the views already. already picked up the story yeah. and they begin broadcasting live radio feed from the bridge. Uh, Captain, the passengers are... Imagine that, seeing it, sitting in such a situation where you have to tune into the local news who are telling you that, hey, the ship that you are on is fucked. Get the hell out. And the, the captain's just like, hey, it's okay. Everything's fine. It's, uh, it's but a flesh wound. <laughs> going on board the boats. Okay, let them go to shore. So then general emergency? Wait, no. Nah. Let me talk to Ferrarini. Oh, stop! We risk the emergency generators. Stop! Not have it's already we over! Have cooling problems. 100 degrees. The cooling fan has stopped. Pilon calls the bridge and tells the safety officer they need to evacuate. The safety officer relays this to the captain, but after no response, he orders the engine room to evacuate on his own. The captain says, no, stay. We'll leave it. So what do we do? General emergency? <laughs> The captain tells Ferrarini that he's abandoning ship. Abandoned ship. Another announcement is made. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. The situation is under control. Please remain calm. And at this time, proceed to your master station. 
The Livorno Coast Guard calls again. The captain declares distress. The Coast Guard officially calls for rescue operations. They contact Pietro Mille, the helicopter base commander, who then calls in every available pilot. Why does he look like such a badass? To the helicopter base. Pilon shuts down the emergency generator. They should have called Dominic Toretto and said that it was all about family. By this point, the lifeboats are already going. Luckily, the ship is very close to shore. Oh. Perhaps too close to shore. Yeah. The ship forcefully runs aground, creating an uneven center of gravity, and it begins heavily listing starboard. The that was my point from before. On board. The announcement to abandon ship is finally called, and alarms ring out. And with that comes panic. And now that they're listing, with many of the lifeboats too awkwardly positioned to enter the water, there aren't enough readily available, and they have to start going back and forth to the shore, picking people up and dropping them off. The patrol boats report to the Livorno Harbour Master that the ship has run aground and is listing heavily. So the Harbour Master asks the captain about it, and the captain says, no, 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 the ship is still floating. Everything's fine. Uh, in fact, we're trying to manoeuvre it onto the shore. They know he's lying. Hold on, I'm reversing it. Beep, 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 beep. The captain then says to bottom out the starboard anchor. So they drop out the anchors, but let out too much chain, effectively rendering them useless. <sighs> The deputy mayor of Giglio, Mario Pellegrini, <laughs> and tobacco shop owner Giovanni Rossi arrive at the harbour. They watch the scene unfold. As the first of the lifeboats arrive on shore, the deputy mayor takes the initiative and races to board one of the lifeboats, returning to the ship. He starts trying to find someone in charge. He gives up and starts helping passengers. Boy. Scatino tells everyone to leave and take radios, but not before changing out of his uniform mm -hmm. and into a nice suit. Of course! Priorities. Dimitri Christidis and Silvia Koronica leave with him. The maitre d' and Sir Morton both get out of there. By this point, approximately 300 people are still on the ship. Melee reaches the helicopter base. The first helicopter, a slow-moving Augusta Bell, was already mm. rising from the tarmac for the hour-long flight south. Bozio is the last crew member left on the bridge, coordinating what the What a chat. He then leaves to help passengers board lifeboats. The bridge is now The abandoned. actual captain. And then, the ship's black box stops working. Apparently there were technical problems with it. No From way! Here, things are going to get a little foggy in detail. A while later, rescue helicopters arrive, but they're struggling to find the ship because they're expecting it to still be well above water. Uh, no. Passengers are scaling down the port side by ladder as lifeboats return to pick them up. This is no, no joke. Oh my goodness. This is no, no joke anymore. Yes. You're not allowed to make a film I'm, movie. I'm allowed, I'm allowed. Who say you are? The wonders, the wonders of the random person who always pulls up a phone at the right moment. This lady is a freaking hero. A second helicopter, a faster model, sets off. The ship stops healing and comes to a final resting place. Now the Coast Guard calls the captain because he's just learned that the captain has abandoned ship. Yeah. The captain claims, uh, uh, no, actually, I slipped and I fell into one of the lifeboats. Ooh, I'm a klutz. But now that I'm on board, I, I may as well head back to shore. DeFelco tells the captain to get the fuck back on board. <laughs> and the captain kind of acts confused and then effectively refuses. So the captain makes it to shore. From here, we only have mainstream news reports to rely on, so it's not going to be super accurate. But they say that Giglio's police chief then finds 110 survivors on the rocks at Point Gabianara. And among them is the captain. It's not known whether the captain helped anyone while he was there. And in fact, the police chief claimed that he just sat on the rocks and watched other people do the rescuing. A while later, a rescue boat picks up the captain and takes him to the harbor. He speaks to the police. He then finds the ship's onboard chaplain, Father Rafael Molina, and cry to him for about 15 minutes. Then he goes to the harbour master's office to receive probably the biggest dressing down of his entire life. Port authorities ask the taxi driver to take the captain back to his hotel. The captain takes the 30-second cab ride to the Bahamas Hotel. According to the cabbie, he was beaten like a dog. He was cold and afraid. He only asked me where he could buy a <laughs> pair of fresh socks. <laughs> but then he perked right up again and gave an interview to a news crew. He told them that he was the last to leave. 
The captain is usually the last to abandon oh. ship. What happened, Captain? We were the last to leave the ship. Bruh. They said they rescue a search for the ship. On Sunday morning, a South Korean couple is found in their cabin, safe but shivering. They had slipped through the crash and woke up unable to exit their cabin. The last survivor, Manrico Giampandroni, was found with a broken leg. He was the cabin service director. Oh. In the end, 32 people died. The final body wasn't discovered until nearly three years later. A crew oh, member, shit. Russell Rebello, and it's believed that he died a hero helping passengers off the ship. The Costa Concordia was the largest cruise ship disaster since the Titanic. Bloody hell. And Wait, then there's there. the ship. This is what happens to a 110,000 ton cruise liner when it's left half rolled over in the ocean. Oh, but there are still things inside. That's the part, that's the part that I talked about in the beginning. When people heard about this, people were flooding down to the coastline to take pictures, to dive into it and salvage whatever they could. And of course, there were people there who were down there to loot. I wanted to see the whole thing. Like, I've never seen a ship. Like, I've been diving sometimes, but I've never seen a massive ship like that crash on the shore. I wanted to see that thing. And my, <laughs> my parents were like, What the fuck do you think you're doing? You're not traveling anywhere. You're going to stay here. But yeah, okay. This, uh, this is crazy. Look at that. See, that's why we have like a kind of Tower of Babel scenario. But this one is not, well, it's due to the hubris of the captain. But this isn't the end, it's just the halfway point. <laughs> what most people know is that the Costa Concordia had crashed, many dead, and then the captain abandoned ship like a coward. But there's a whole veritable spaghetti of details to untangle. Okay. Let's dive in. Ah! Oh no! The deets. Oh, wow. Wow, are you fucking serious? The looting, yeah, here we go. Here we go. Loot box time. The Costa Concordia was more than just a floating resort. There's a mall. A casino. Cha ching, cha ching. This yep. iron chest was treasure full of hunt. And cash registers and expensive fittings. And there were plenty of gamers prepared to sneak by authorities <laughs> and try their luck in the hot zone. Within days, police divers reported that valuable items, once seen lying around the ship, were now missing. <laughs> High-end liquor, expensive furniture, dining sets, cash from the casino, cash registers, jewelry and display cabinets, safes, Japanese woodblock prints by famous 18th century artists, mm. as well as the iconic <laughs> bell, which hung from the bridge of the ship. It was never found. <laughs> How? Tilts a big fuck off bell. <laughs> How the Super fuck? admins were getting involved. <laughs> Four divers who were part of the company contracted to refloat the Concordia were spotted on CCTV sneaking out to the ship. A patrol boat was dispatched, and the men were caught inside the fancy suites with rucksacks full of stolen goods. The four men are charged with mm -hmm. stealing and thieving and pinching. Yep. Later on, stolen as well as legitimate items found their way to Amazon and eBay. Chips from the casino, postcards, and cabin access cards became highly sought after souvenirs. It even has a watermark. Some Australian guy even made a listing for the ship itself, <laughs> advertising it as buyer to collect. <laughs> and although there were plenty of bidders, eBay pulled the plug. <laughs> this man got big brain. That is such a, a, a 40 chess move. I love him. The relationship. I know you want to see Scatino go to jail and we'll get to that. But first, 
We the have girlfriend. To talk about someone else. Dominica Samorton. You are not allowed to make films. There was speculation that she was on the bridge that evening because she was the captain's mistress. Oh, no. Intense media speculation reports that her presence distracted the captain. They both denied their love for years and maintained that they were just friends. Although she did later admit to the media that she found him handsome. Ooh. And how could you not? You so <laughs> Precious, when you <laughs> oh, oh no, I didn't need to see that. Says there was no romantic link between them. Some people would like to believe, they want to know I have something with him. It's more interesting. It's like, you know, some spicy, spicy. in the story. Mr. Morton also loved the spotlight, however. Oh, everyone, oh no. <laughs> and took several <laughs> interviews. Of course. But as the pressure mounted upon her, she began making ominous threats to Scatino. Saying he must confess, and that you have but one week to come clean. Oh, <laughs> weird. Spicy. Sir Morton is a bit of a wild card. <laughs> In a subsequent interview, she claimed a helicopter came to the ship well before the other rescue craft to take away a package. Huh? huh? And what was that package? Drugs, apparently. What? So rumors began that the ship was running narcotics for the Mafia. And not without cause, a number of cruise ships, even recently, have been caught trafficking drugs. As an aside, Scudino was tested for drugs immediately after the crash. He tested negative for drugs in his system, oh. but trace amounts of cocaine were found in a hair sample. Makes it smoother. <laughs> How? How? Where do you get the co where do you get the cocaine in your hair? And less dry? Nonetheless, the Concordia was searched and no drugs were reportedly ever found. How did we get here? Oh, right, a helicopter. <laughs> oh, that poor lady! ...again the next day and said, actually, that helicopter was just for the captain as a means of evacuation from the ship. Okay, wait. So she expected to get some sort of first-class rescue while everyone else was still stuck on the ship? Wait, how did we get here? Oh, right, sex with the captain. <laughs> Divers were quick to head to the captain's cabin where they found Miss Samorton's lingerie and other articles of clothing as well as a makeup bag. The jig uh -huh. was up, but they continued denying it. Samorton mostly faded from international attention until she was told to appear before the court to present witness testimony. Yeah. The judge pressed her to be truthful about their relationship, or she would be held in contempt. Either tell me the truth or shut up. <laughs> so finally, she admitted it. She, yes, I had a sentimental relationship with the captain. Stop. But now, stop asking about my private life. She was indeed the captain's lover. What is up, Traveller <laughs> Nation? <laughs> Goddamn Kim Star. Oh my god! She and Scatino had been having an affair for several weeks. She like also said everybody that on the knew. night she boarded, she didn't have a ticket, ticket please. and didn't need to pay because nobody questions you when you're the captain's lover. Naturally, she gave another confusing interview after leaving court. I want to say that today is the second time I die because the first time I die in the night of the crush with my psychological brain and uh, problems. And today I die the second time because, of course, people <laughs> find out something that I try to hide. Subsequent to the trial, she used her fame in Moldova to become a political activist, often appearing on television and radio and in articles covering protests, accompanied by pictures of her being arrested by police. <laughs> wow, she loved the spotlight, huh? It was some stuff about victims of violence, women's rights, Girl power. yada yada yada. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, part of a push to block the sale of shares of Moldova's train network to Russia. Sure, sure. Okay. Other than that, I don't really know what she's been up to. Let me just check on her ins. No, oh God, not again. <laughs> please, please stop this woman. <laughs> oh. Several the aftermath is even crazier. Costa Crociere, and their parent company, Carnival Cruises, immediately saw a share drop of 23%. Hello? 
don't beat. The passengers saw enough. compensation for their damaged mental health, lost belongings, and loved ones. Either they allowed him to divert from his course, or they didn't know where their billion dollar ship was. Within a few days, facing financial and media pressure, the sea. When you have a captain that has for subsequent years been crashing ships, it has a history of neglect. Employ somebody who has a language barrier that perhaps had not even undergone. Uh, pff, undergone. Oh my god. This video is making me lose my. <laughs> My tongue here undergone testing to, 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 to check if he was truly adept at doing what he was employed for. You get this. There's a saying in Danish that says that accidents don't happen, right? They are predicted. You have a certain pattern that you follow here, but like this could not lead to anything else but that. They knew. The CEO attempted to join the bandwagon against the captain and the crew. That was not the ordinary route that the ship was uh, taking uh, at the time and, and was not only taking but at the time the, the ship Today, was <laughs> just claiming that the ship was not approved to deviate from the route but that wasn't that true was. approval isn't required if the ship is deviating by less than 15 miles or that it was against company rules also untrue because investigators found that they didn't have any rules about deviating route and they tacitly encouraged sail by salutes. Yeah. Now, in response to the civil suits, Costa Crociere offered passengers 11,000 euros each as compensation. For a lost life. That's kind of small. 11,000 euros, about $14,000, is the minimum compensation under international law when a ship is abandoned. This was to reimburse them for their tickets, as well as any costs they accrued in having to unexpectedly travel home early. And that was supposed to release them from everything and anything that has to do with this accident. I cannot ask for more than this. A lot of passengers, understandably, were not too happy with this deal, and they refused to take the money. We think the offer is an insult. For what these poor passengers went through, we think that the compensation being offered is not commensurate. Here. Take it. Compensation being offered is not commensurate. <laughs> Costa Crociere would lodge a plea deal with the Tuscan oh court to pay a 1 million euro fine Jesse! to avoid a criminal trial. The judge agrees. Costa Crociere is now off the hook for all criminal liability for the whole thing. They wash their hands of the incident and flex the residual droplets of responsibility onto the faces of six staff members. Passengers and relatives of the dead are livid that the company has been able to avoid criminal responsibility. Offer hmm. is not commensurate. Civil suits against the company continue. By the way, the residents of the island of Giglio also banded together and sought damages. They didn't get much. Eventually, passengers who refused the initial compensation of 11,000 joined civil parties against Scatino in his trial in 2015. Not commensurate. They were awarded 30,000 euros each. Other cases, especially those involving lost relatives, okay. are settled for undisclosed amounts. Hmm. New York oh. attorney Peter René traveled to Budapest to represent six real survivors of the disaster. At René and René, we personally work on... Ah, uh, this sounds even worse. Oh, Christ, actors. Oh, this is where you get your Alex Jones from, right? Like, Those crisis actors! You know that they're scamming us! The fake news media! But then, I mean, oh. Oh, God. Luckily, luckily, the ones who actually were affected by it got somewhat of a compensation. It never, it's never going to cover the loss of life. But it's, it's something. It's something. But then you have these assholes scamming it from the lives of others. Every case. And we'll work harder than anyone to get you the most money possible in the shortest amount of time. And while on the job, a seventh case cropped up via mail. email. <laughs> An elderly woman, a loner, Asman. said, Help me, Mr. Ronai, for I have lost my daughter, Eva, and my five-year-old granddaughter, Roxana. So Mr. Ronai agreed to speak with her. However, there were some inconsistencies in her story. Oh. Neither Eva nor oh. Roxana were on the passenger list. Only her. Oh. 
but Costa my bad. is known my for bad. having stowaways. Gotcha, bitch. Still, Mr. Renai was suspicious. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't cheaty old Petey, would they? Renai inquired <laughs> further about why she was on board, especially without a ticket. Ilona said, Well, I don't know, but you should ask her boyfriend. Zolt Horvath. He'll know all details. I'm up all night. I'm going crazy, he said. But Mr. Renai was still suspicious. Because then she asked, How much money do you think this is worth? Uh, oh, no. This is a huge red flag, Petey. In 20 years of doing this, you've never had anyone ask about money. Why now? So Mr. Renai hired an investigator and sent photos around of the missing girl. The next day, the phone rang. Oh, hoi hoi. It was the boyfriend again. Ah, uh, look, there's been a bit of a misunderstanding and the child isn't missing at all. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then he claimed he was confused because he had done too many drugs the night before. Oh. Okay, can I speak to the daughter then? At first, he was refused. So Renai said that he'd have to file a missing persons report to the police if he couldn't. The boyfriend relented. <laughs> yeah. That night, Renai met with Zolt and brought the police with him. He speaks to the granddaughter and asks her if she's seen mum. Yeah, I saw her today. Oh, really? Yeah, we went to the park today and we went on the swings. <laughs> oh no, the jig was up. <laughs> so the mum walks into the room sheepishly. It's a miracle. And the story changed again. Okay, uh, I'm not dead, but I did injure me leg when I jumped from the ship. What is and up with this lie? back to Budapest. Although don't worry about checking my leg because there are no visible marks or injuries. Uh, <laughs> 4K. Okay. I'm beginning to think they weren't even on the boat. <laughs> also, it turns out this lady isn't her mum, it's just a neighbour. Eventually, Renee managed to make the pair confess. And then they said, hey, we haven't done anything wrong. We haven't taken any money. And in the end, uh, it looks like there's yeah. no criminal punishment for the scam. Because Hungary, a former communist country, has no laws against insurance fraud on the books. The law firm that never sleeps, call 1-800-664-7. Yo, guys, now you know where to go if you want to ever commit insurance fraud. You travel, you you pull your ass all the way to Europe. Get down to Hungary. Vada Bordo. Mario, would you teach me some Italian? Oh, no. Oh, Shenmue Tree's out, actually. Get back on board for fuck's sake. Oh, for sake. free. Okay, thanks. Gregorio de Felco, the naval officer who shouted at Scutino to Vada a bordo caso, Get became back a bit of a national ship. overnight in Italy. He, like the rest of the world, expected Scutino to go down with the ship. <laughs> And when the Stop. captain chickened out, DeFelco was there to admonish him. And when he stopped answering the radio, he called him on his cell phone to continue putting him on blast. When the captain first reported mm -hmm. just a blackout, DeFelco didn't believe the story and immediately began preparing a rescue effort, which likely saved several lives. His actions were applauded by most Italians who were tired of their public servants being corrupt and avoiding responsibility. Accordingly, shirts sporting Vada a bordo caso were being printed oh. by the end of the week, others setting it as their phone's ringtone. <laughs> but then, in September 2014, without warning, DeFalco was transferred to an admin role in the Coast Guard. Hear what I said, he'd been demoted. DeFalco said that he had been passed Why? up for promotion, that he had also not been told which admin office he was even being transferred to, and that it all effectively cancelled 10 years of his career. DeFelco was Tres Furioso. Yeah. It was <laughs> Idiot. Très Furious. Bad blood between himself and Admiral Delano, his former boss. His status among the public overshadowed his superior in many ways. Oh, On the other wow. hand, his boss said, ah, no, it's part of a normal career progression for naval officers and that he must show more maturity and professionalism. To Says advance. you! Now, it's hard to know what's true in office politics, so let's leave that alone. And anyway, in 2018, DeFelco said buenas noches, ya later, to the Italian Navy to become a politician. In March that year, he was elected to the Italian Senate, serving as a member for Livorno. He still serves there today. Yeah, people trust him because he actually wants to serve the people. That's... None too common. It's 
Scatino, let's the go back to that the disaster, guy. Scatino was taken into custody by police and underwent questioning. <laughs> However, it was clear that this would not be a straightforward investigation. So the judge released him under house arrest at his home in Sorrento, a town in Napoli. A pasta na pista, by let's July put Scatino year, into jail. Was relaxed and he was allowed within this general area. While under house arrest, he wrote a book with this journalist from Rai magazine. I have no idea what it says, I don't speak Italian. But goddammit, he must have some kind of charisma going on, because there's been a lot of speculation in the press that he had an affair with her as well. <laughs> Hold on, I got it, I got it. Not content with abandoning his ship, this dude is determined to abandon his wife as well. So, Scatino and five others are facing criminal charges. Uh -huh. Straight away, everyone lodges a plea bargain with the court. And all of those plea bargains are accepted, except for Scatino's. Thank you. And the condition of everyone's reduced sentences are that they must provide witness testimony against, against Scatino. Scatino. Oh, me. that's not going Zero to be hard. Sylvia were all given suspended sentences. Roberto and Manrico are able to opt for community service or house arrest. Not a bad deal. A good deal. A very good deal. And that meant that Scatino was now all on his own. Ciro, the first officer, was the first to give his testimony. On the witness stand, he claimed that Scatino was distracted by his mistress and other guests on the bridge. <laughs> oh my god! There was confusion over who was in command. Then it was Jacob's turn. Aww. And he said, Lamau XD, because he didn't actually bother with his testimony or his reduced sentence. He just fled the country. It took authorities 12 months to eventually track him. What do you gotta do? You're like an immigrant or something? That wow, well, he's close enough. Uh, like the, the, you've crashed a ship, and you think it's all your fault. The captain, being the asshole, just leaves everybody behind and leaves you to take the fault. What do you gotta do? Uh, this is not the right move. But I get, I get like a sentiment for his action. Him down on the outskirts of Jakarta. And when they said, Oi, we still want that witness testimony, he just scarfed again. <laughs> and he hasn't been found since. <laughs> oh! After wow! He gave his <laughs> this testimony, dude. then so. Oh, look, we don't have time to relitigate the whole trial. So let's just go straight to the verdict. Guilty! Scatino was found guilty of multiple manslaughter, causing a shipwreck, abandoning ship, and lying to authorities. He is sentenced to 16 years and one month in prison. Only? I mean, something, but, wait, but still. There's still the appeals. The appeals trial begins. And the verdict on the appeal? No. <laughs> Surprise! Rejected. Whew. So Scatino's lawyers appealed again. And the verdict on the final appeal? Scatino made multiple attempts to secure a plea deal, but was denied by the prosecution each time. The prosecution uh, called for Scatino to be sentenced to 26 years in prison. Oh, see, imagine. A Titanic affair. Oh, okay, I see what you did there. Scatino was not present. His lawyer stated that he was waiting outside of the jail for the ruling, so that if his plea was rejected, he could immediately start serving his sentence. And with that, five years and four months after the disaster, he was finally in a cell. A bad time. <laughs> I, I did not expect this. I did absolutely not expect this. This is glorious. The salvage operation was enormous. It took over two years and cost an estimated $1.2 billion. Beginning in early 2012, they first spent two months pumping fuel from the ship's tanks. At the same time, they had to pump seawater in so that the balance wasn't affected and the ship yeah. didn't slide around. In early 2013, a platform was built under the ship to prevent it from falling further. But all Sponsons the were then attached crazy to the, engineering the ship and cables attached to the underwater platform. The sponsons were then dragged underwater and opened up to allow the ocean to fill them. The ship could then roll over properly. By late 2013, the ship was upright once more. Now the excavation could the happen. The sponsons were then attached to the side of the ship to help keep it balanced. It now rested partially above water and crews could walk around safely. 
By July 2014, the water was removed from the sponsons and compressed air was pumped in to lift the ship. And she was ready to cruise again. This time to a port in Genoa. It was a four-day towing journey to the docks where a two-year process of dismantling and recycling would begin. That same weekend of the towing, Scatino was busy. He was the guest of honor at a white party on an island in the Bay of Naples. He what? appeared on the front page of a local newspaper. What? By two of Italy's most eligible bachelorettes. <laughs> wow, this was a tale. A tale anyway, to remember. So these are the things that I remember from the Costa Concordia. That That's good. sweet maiden of the sea. Yoink. And as for you, little fella. <laughs> he took it. <laughs> he fucking took it. <laughs> well, it's time to return you. From whence you came. <laughs> There's nothing I fear. <laughs> Bloody. <laughs> Six quick things. One, NordVPN, good product, check them out. Number two. There's a new video on the second channel. You probably didn't see it before. Yeah, it's temporarily mode. restricted. Now it's not. Enjoy. Three, if you've never seen the second channel before, give it a go. It's a different type of content, but we put a lot of production into it. It's not just offcuts. Four, there are a couple of secret channels as well, but I ain't telling you where they are. Five, no more 45-minute videos on the main channel. Back to 10 to 15 minutes and more of them. Six, there's a Q&A coming out next week on incognito mode. It's got a ton of detail that we had to cut for the sake of brevity and will no doubt feature a ton of corrections. At okay. Well, this has been it. This was a wonderful one. A great video by the internet historian here. I it, There was so many things, like past the whole thing of him fleeing from the ship. I was so... Yeah, clueless on the situation for it, but yeah, what do you know? Costa Concordia was definitely, definitely the tragedy of that decade. But we have a new one, and we're expecting another. <laughs> but guys, thank you so much for watching this video along with me. And of course, you know what to do. Hit that like and subscribe button if you like this video, if you like this reaction, and subscribe, of course, if you want to see more. And with that said, I wish you all a wonderful evening. See you guys next time. Bye.